you know, I'm gonna eat, I'm just gonna spend the rest of my life eating shrimp because they fucking love it. Um, Dude, I'm just thinking about sadomasochistic shrimp. <laughs> just like boil me longer, daddy. <laughs> Okay, howdy everyone. Uh, Apologies for the lack of episodes recently. Been a little busy for both of us, but for Vaden in particular, as he was defending his thesis. But uh, unsurprisingly, all went very smoothly there, and Vaden is now officially Dr. Vaden. We're going to be back to recording new content in January, but over the break, we're going to release two bonus episodes, uh, and one of which is this one. The following convo was recorded with Nick Anyos, who is about to release a new podcast about criticisms of EA. Uh, We mostly cover the foundations of probability and touch a little bit on long-termism. So if you're interested in the weeds of the philosophy of probability and hearing someone very kindly criticize our takes, then this may be of interest. But it's also understandable if you're sick of hearing us talk about these topics. Like so many EAs, Nick vehemently disagrees with us, but does so in the nicest possible way. So I definitely recommend checking out his podcast when it's up. I don't actually know the details yet, but we'll let you know when we do. One last bit of housekeeping. We've been asked by a few people now to talk about the SBF saga. To be honest, we're not terribly interested in doing that because it's unlikely we'll have much to add beyond all that's been said already. It uh, doesn't seem like all the facts are in yet, so I'm pretty wary of hypothesizing too much about what exactly went on there. It also doesn't seem particularly sporting to pile on during a very difficult time for EA and when lots of people, including Baden actually, have lost work and money because of the fallout. It's possible we'll still talk about in the future if we think something comes up that's worth discussing. But for now, we're just going to leave that topic be and move on to other things. With that, hope everyone has the best of holidays and I wish everyone much love. And let the probabilistic mayhem begin. Well, yeah, awesome. Thank you guys so much for coming along to talk to me. Excited yeah. to be here. This is, the, this is the first time I've been interviewed on another person's podcast. So I'm a little nervous. So be gentle. It's my first time. Uh, now, now you know how it feels. So yeah, so I wasn't quite sure how to structure this. I was thinking either I throw it to you guys for a, hey, let's summarize your like critique of EA. Or we start with like my impression of like based on the podcast and then you guys saying what i got right or what i got wrong uh do you ha- guys have a preference between those two options i like the second option myself but <laughs> yeah me too i'd like to hear you try and summarize it yeah yeah yeah, yeah, so, yeah. well we've communicated some of the ideas in the podcast yeah. so yeah second option sounds great okay great yeah so my reading is that you have quite a lot of criticisms of effective altruism, in particular of the long-termism section. So I gather that you're pretty on board with the kind of give well style cost effectiveness estimates and like donating to places like give directly. And also that you think that like animal lives have some value and that organizations working on improving the welfare of animals in factory farms also have value and that's all good. But yeah, it's this, uh, the long-term area and particularly AI, but probably also other existential risks that you're like more skeptical of working towards. Yeah, I was like writing a list of the different kind of issues you had with uh, long termism. A lot of them are like separable. Uh, Yeah, like they don't like all depend on each other. And so there were some that I wanted to focus more on, because I think those ones a more core to how I think about EA in general. I want to talk about Bayesian epistemology stuff more than some of the other criticisms you have of long-termism. Because from my perspective, the Bayesian epistemology expected value uh, calculus is also very much how I think about the global health and animal interventions. Yeah, so so that would be a more core disagreement. It would affect mm. uh, not just like like if you guys like change my mind about this, it wouldn't just affect how I think about long termism. It would affect how I think about like every decision in my entire life. So mm. yeah, like you guys had a in one of your podcasts, you mentioned the metaphor of the fish in water of the like yeah, yeah. you know one fish is like, um, hey, how's the water? And then mm-hmm. the other fish is like, what the fuck is water? Uh, and I, so, yeah. So, and I very much feel like that. So like the, the kind of this way of making decisions, uh, which we'll talk about 
of um, expected value and Bayesian uh, reasoning is like, yeah, very, very much embedded in me. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. So yeah, so I think, yeah, that'll be mainly interesting. Awesome. Um, Yeah. Does that sound, does that sound good? That sounds groovy. Yeah, it sounds fun. Awesome. So yeah, so given we want to focus on that area of, or yeah, I'll ask you what you think, um, or like how you think about or define this kind of Bayesian epistemology plus expected value decision making utility maximizing and maybe your problems with it and then also the alternative critical rationalism uh framework and yeah how that's Mm -hmm. different and the advantages yeah so i can maybe say a few words to kick things off about what um, i mean when i talk about bayesian epistemology uh, just to kind of frame the conversation so bayesian epistemology is um, basically using the calculus of probability on subjective belief states so each belief you have is to be assigned a number, a number between zero and one. Um, and this number represents your confidence in that proposition. Broad strokes, that's what Bayesian epistemology is. Why I th- have such a problem with it, um, I think it leads pretty quickly to mistakes. Um, so I'll just highlight one mistake and then maybe we can start riffing off that. Uh, but probabilities are not all made equal. Um, and so when you talked about using Bayesian epistemology um, when you're thinking through questions about long-termism, uh, and you said that you also use Bayesian epistemology when you're thinking about questions of, say, global health and uh, give well and, and their estimates. Uh, but by saying that, we're already, I think, slipping into error because we're conflating two different kinds of probability. Um, and that's really where a lot of my um, problems come, uh, because probability from the Bayesian epistemological lens, uh, it has to do with how much you believe something. But from, a say, a scientific lens or from a statistical lens, um, it has to do with uh, the frequency of certain events. So to give kind of uh, one toy example of what this means, um, if you go to the doctor and the doctor says uh, you have 50% chance of, um, say, dying from uh, this brain tumor, if they're, taking a, if they're thinking about this from a kind of a statistical scientific lens, what they mean is uh, of 100,000 people who have similar brain tumors like yourself, about 50% of these are going, uh, people are going to die. Um, If they take it from a Bayesian epistemological lens, what they mean is um, my gut feeling is that you have a 50% chance of living, uh, which is equivalent to saying I put no more probability on the proposition that you do live versus you don't live, which is equivalent to saying, I don't know. I basically, there's no reason to favor one outcome or another outcome. Uh, So these are two very different uh, meanings behind the notion of probability. Uh, But when we forget that these two two different notions are being um, used, then we're liable to make comparisons between these kinds of things. So Toby Ord in his book talks about there being, I'm just going to roughly make up numbers, but I think they're on the right order of magnitude, um, like a one in 10,000 chance of uh, extinction by volcano or by asteroid. Um, And then he says there's a one in 10 chance of um, extinction by uh, artificial general intelligence. But now he's conflating these two things. Uh, So when you talk about asteroids and volcanoes, you can count the number of asteroids and volcanoes. Uh, But when you're talking about the future, there's nothing to count. Uh, so people use made up numbers instead and then just start making comparisons between these two things. But these are not the same thing. And so this is one of my big problems with with give well, or excuse me, with um, how probabilities are used in the effective altruist community, because um, as soon as you have a probability number, you can just start comparing these different things. But these numbers are arrived at from very different places and you have uh, very different degrees of evidence behind these numbers. Um, and so I think people... Um, aren't careful enough to only compare subjective prob. So one thing you could say is, well, Vaden, are you saying you can never ever use subjective probabilities? To which my answer would be no. Um, there are definitely circumstances where it might be a useful thinking tool, but we should be damn careful not to compare subjective probabilities and objective probabilities, because these are very different beasts. One, when you're talking about objective probabilities, you're, you're referring to things in the world that you can count. Um, and when you're talking about subjective probabilities, probabilities you're talking about um, just belief states, just feelings, just their, their gut feeling numbers. Um, and so when uh, 80,000 hours and give well and effective altruism, when they start doing these comparisons and saying, well, we have a one in 10 chance of dying from AGI and we only have a one in um, 200 chance of dying from asteroids or what have you, um, they're, they're just making it an error. They're comparing things that shouldn't be compared. Um, and so that's one of the big issues I, I have with it. Um, there's others as well, but maybe I'll, that's enough for, for now. Uh, yeah, excellent. I think that um, that hits right at the heart of the area that I want to, like the disagreement I want to discuss. So that's really awesome. good. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so my thoughts on that is that even in the most evidence-based give well style interventions, uh, and also 
like like depending on the examples we want to hone in on this is also true of like when i'm like deciding where to eat dinner or whatever um i think there's a i think there's always a mixture of objective and subjective probabilities so for example my stylistic you know simplified narrative of how givewell makes a decision would be that when they're trying to find the cost effectiveness of AMF the against malaria foundation they will look at academic studies on how well bed nets reduce malaria and that will be one source of evidence and that's like we can that's something we can run randomized controlled trials on uh, and get a, a high degree of uh, confidence on then they will look at the organization that implements the intervention uh and their track record and uh how much in the past their costs of distribution have been so per million dollars of their budget how many nets are distributed and then they will you know also some other factors but yeah then they will calculate that and come up with uh a number um but i think yeah so so i think this is a mix of objective and subjective so like one example would be when i donate to amf there's a chance that they just take my money and go buy drugs with it or something right or that like they yeah that the person running it gets struck by lightning or that like uh maybe more to the academic thing maybe the study was run in one country in africa and now amf is distributing nets to a neighboring country and when i try to think about that i my thought process is okay well the neighboring country that might be that may that may have a different prevalence of malaria or the way nets are used like the percentage of people that use their nets properly maybe less um or it could be like there are factors that could push it in either way and i don't particularly have a reason to think that the country would make it more or less likely so those two roughly cancel out so i'll just treat it as the same um but in other areas if there is a reason why it would be in one direction so if yeah so so like i think um maybe the studies that showed that the uh nets protect some amount if they were done a few years ago in general we would expect the mosquitoes to evolve a like slight resistance to the uh insecticide-ness that is put on the nets so i would expect them to get like slightly less effective over time uh, rather than say more effective so that's one where it pushes in one direction and the way i but i obviously can't quantify that you know at all i'm just like currently it's just a a sentence in my head of like or like with my background knowledge of how evolution works and so i just say okay well in that case i'll shift my how much i think amf helps slightly downwards because of that like evolutionary argument but it's only like a 1% shift or like some very small shift uh which is totally made up number in my head and b- because of that it's still is enough that i think that amf is still like a really good option and maybe better than other options yeah so so with that kind of explanation of my thought process can you yeah maybe say if you disagree with that thought process and if i should do it differently or if you're like yep that sounds all good why isn't that thought process like why can't i use a similar thought process when i'm thinking about uh more long termist existential risk issues can i uh, can i just try and paraphrase the the concern first so i think what you're saying is look there are holes in our knowledge all over the place and so even when we're trying to determine what an effective global health intervention is uh we're making guesses on some things at the end of the day most notably with rcts you're kind of wondering how far they generalize right so rcts are typically done in a particular place in time and you know they're maybe maybe run a study in kenya and then you talk about distributing malarial bed nets in south africa and so you want to say well that's like a huge source of uncertainty and so we have to put some like numerical belief on that 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 the effect of that study can translate uh, to multiple domains um and so this is purely a difference of degree not of kind for what we're doing in long-termism uh there we might just be starting in slightly more uncertain waters but 
all the same, we're dealing in this land of uncertainty. And so we should just put numbers on all of these things. And so is that kind of the is that kind of the concern? Like these are we, we kind of have to do this anyway. And you're drawing a false distinction when you talk about like give well versus long termism, because it's not like give well is just some absolutely robust probability and there's no subjective judgment going on there. And so we have to do the same thing when it comes to long term causes. And so uh, shut up about your objective probability. <laughs> <Is> that- <laughs> yeah, exactly. Including including the shut up part. Like, <laughs> that, that's, that's the most important part. When you're arguing against Baden. Like tone wise is exactly what I'm going for. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Thank you. Um, ben, do you want to answer that, or do you want me to? Um, sure. I mean, yeah. There's a there's a couple things to pull apart, uh, but I'll just start with one. And one is just the difference between what's like resolvable and not, and what should we like want to put numbers on. I think the presupposition is your in your question is when we're dealing with like the uncertainty in the give well case, uh, what we should have is some numerical number, you know, this credence that the, the study run in Kenya, that the, the findings can also be applied in, in South Africa. Um, I think that's the wrong way to look about it, to look at the, the question, right? So we're running a study. We look at the effect of the study. We have some causal mechanism, typically, when we're talking about RCTs. So we talk about like why bed nets reduce malaria. Uh, it's rare these days that RCTs are just run with like, does this affect? Yes, no. We have like some mechanism. And now we're in the land of wondering whether this mechanism will also apply in South Africa, right? And now this is something that um, we can debate. We can talk about uh, the socio-political situation. Um, And then to resolve our uncertainty, most importantly, we can just run another study. We can say, okay, there's one contingent of people who think that uh, this will not hold in South Africa. There's another contingent of people who do. Um, Here are the reasons for both positions. And now we can run a study to resolve our uncertainty. Okay. Uh, there's no such thing as res- as running another study on the long-termism causes because the feedback effects sort of by definition are non-existent because you're talking about trying to affect people, you know, millions of billions of years in the future. There's no way to run a study on what I'm doing now and then be able to tell, oh, did this cause the end of civilization, uh, you know, circa 3000 BC or whatever. And so there's there's no feedback effect there. So I don't, view the give well situation as us just like putting numbers on stuff and going with our best guess. It's just a continual process of us gaining more information, asking better questions, positing causal mechanisms, falsifying those mechanisms with more and more studies, constantly debating with each other. And yeah, at every point in time, uh, we're going with our best guess. But those best guesses are come to by like debating the actual mechanisms behind the what the effect is. It's not about just like me saying the probability is a third and you saying the probability is three over seven and Baden saying probability is 0.9, right? That's not how these these things go, right? Just like walk into any uh, development econ seminar and people are like throwing reasons at each other, not throwing numbers at each other. Yeah, just to um, add another dimension. So um, I was not saying that subjectivity doesn't um, affect, say, uh, data analysis, um, because I think, Nick, you had pointed out that when you're uh, analyzing data, it's you have to make a lot of subjective decisions throughout the whole uh, process, uh, to which Ben says, yes, and the reason why this is effective in the give case is because you can falsify these assumptions. So you can f- there's a way to adjudicate whose assumptions are better than whose other assumptions. Um, but what I want to highlight is that in both the long-term case and the I don't even like the near-termist framing because that's kind of conceding language. Yeah. But in the long-termist case and in the common sense case, at the end of the day, all you have are arguments and reasons and debates. Uh, and so when you walk through your internal thought process, I thought that was excellent. And I would just stop at the putting a number on it stage because I don't think you need to put a number on your thoughts. Um, I don't think that that uh, helps. I think like if we do like a Sam Harris-style analysis of the reasoning process, you have, say, 10 different causes um, that you're interested in. And for each of these, you spend a lot of time generating different arguments, which um, have different degrees of validity. And then you want to kind of put the icing on the cake by saying, OK, so I'm going to put a nu- this number here, this number there, this number there, and then rank order. Um, but you can just do the rank ordering with the arguments. And the reason why I think it can lead to errors when you put numbers on your beliefs is it gives you this false sense of precision this false sense that you've actually, you, you've finished your reasoning process now. So then uh, another question might be, well, when do you want to put numbers on things? To which I would say, when you're measuring something or when you're counting something. Um, so measurements and counting are where I think is the natural domain for um, putting numbers on stuff. Uh, so this is where you get experimental data. It's messy, so you have to start making simplifying assumptions, but you're interacting with the world. 
Um, and it's this interaction with the world and the use of mathematics in some cases to, to make this interaction easier, which is where I think the appropriate domain of, of numbers and mathematics is. Um, but when you're just putting numbers on wild, fanciful speculations about like omniscient, super intelligent beings and um, on how much like Ben and I went to a con like a little one day conference, like on how much shrimp suffer. And they were all really obsessed about trying to put numbers on this. I think you're just uh, deluding yourself because unfortunately in these domains, we don't have feedback mechanisms. So Ben and I would want to say something like, okay, well, we just have to proceed very cautiously knowing that we can't really get a lot of answers here because there's no way to falsify our, our views. Uh, whereas Bayesian epistemologists um, or people who think more in the, the, the Bayesian manner would want to say, well, there's a lot of uncertainty. And so we can turn to our favorite tool, expected values, and just like slice through this uncertainty and start um, uh, getting, making progress on intractable problems where I just think these kinds of problems are intractable and we should uh, just work that into how we think about the world and how we think about proceeding. Um, so rather than trying to perfectly find um, the precise probability for AGI, we should just talk about realistic scenarios, which could possibly happen and how best to um, uh, prevent the negative um, consequences of what we think is most likely. But it's the, it's the putting a number on your belief at the end of your reasoning process, which I think is in the best case superfluous and in the worst case actively um, leading to errors. I'd actually, I'd, I'd be curious about your reaction to, to this. So to turn it back on you a bit, like my sense is that, you know, when a, when a problem, when there's a lot of uncertainty to do with a problem, that typically just means there's lots of different opinions about it. People aren't sure how to proceed or confused. And so typically like lots of people debating. And then, if, so like you have this debate at the end of the day, you say, I'm going to put 10% on this question, whatever it is. Um, I'm curious to know what that's getting you at the end of the day, because my sense is that when you actually want to revisit that, what you do is descend back down into at the level of argumentation. And so this is like a weird paradox that I find in the EA community is that they are exceptionally good at just debating things. And then there's this, yeah, there's this final step where they like put numbers on stuff, but it's actually very unclear what the number is doing in a lot of these cases, because, uh, you know, this is a community that writes like 10 page long blog posts, uh, carefully examining each other's reasoning, looking at why everything's wrong, right? Um, and that this is an amazing process, right? And like the community's in dialogue with each other. It's great. And then you know, right before the lights go out and the stock market shuts down, say, you know, put 23% on this and then we'll open it back up for discussion tomorrow morning. Um, and it's just, I'm, I'm truly at a loss as to like what that number is doing and what it's sort of getting you, you know, and then to, sometimes it is cashed out, right? So sometimes the discussion ends, Toby Ord puts it in his book and then people cite that as something authoritative down the line, which, and then we kind of forget that these numbers were made up in the first place. But I view most of the time, the community just having like this healthy sense of debate about it. And the numbers actually not doing that much. So I'd be curious from your perspective, like what, what most of the time when you're walking around and you're quantifying your own beliefs, putting credences on this, credences on that, what is that getting you? Awesome. So to respond to that, and then also the earlier thing you said about the difference between the give well charities and their cost effectiveness estimates compared to more long-termist interventions. Yeah. So I think what you said was with the give well studies, the, the uncertainties I mentioned about the prevalence of malaria in one country versus the other, or the effectiveness over time, that's something that we can go and take actions in the world today or tomorrow and reduce our uncertainty. So like we can run another randomized control trial. We can get more data. We, you know, can, you know, reanalyze the data looking for biases, etc. Um, whereas we can't do that with, yeah, as you said, if we're trying to figure out our actions a billion years in the future, at the very least, it'll take a billion years. And even then, like, like you can't run a randomized control trial on, yeah, um, yeah. So my thoughts on that are that... With the GiveWell example, we can get more certainty by running more studies or yet yeah, getting other forms of evidence. But the choice that I have currently today is either donate money to Against Malaria Foundation, save money 
and maybe donate it later or donate to another charity or spend it on ice cream for myself. So the reason why I don't think it makes sense to just always wait for more information is that so eventually hopefully malaria will be gone right if i yeah if i just save my money until you know there's been a hundred more randomized controlled trials then maybe i've missed an opportunity to actually give to a high valued org or intervention and you know do good yeah i i guess what i'm saying is that waiting for more evidence is also a choice and sometimes that is the right choice. So yeah, the kind of Bayesian expected value way of thinking about this is you have your current belief that AMF works, and then you have the action of giving to AMF now or waiting for more data. And then you think about what the likelihood that you'll like get better information in the future, how much that will like shift your probabilities. And then there's like a formula for like the value of information, which is like how much better your decision will be if you get that information. So like some information is much more decision relevant than others. So if I get a piece of information that changes my donation from AMF to give directly, then that's like more valuable than if it is, you know, some other random thing. Yeah. So, so we have to do the best with the information we have. We should go out and get more information but that is also a choice that also has a cost and we should like weigh up the costs and values and sometimes sometimes the best decision is to act before we get this more information um okay and yeah so in terms of the why so the other thing is like okay nick you're saying all these things but why put numbers on them you could have just said everything you said without the quantifying aspect, like you said, that like, you know, we write, you know, hundreds of pages of like why AI will or won't happen or why nuclear war will or won't happen. Why then summarize that at the end with a number? Okay, so there's the minor reason, which I think is the communication aspect, which is that if I say, hey, I think there's a chance that China will invade Taiwan in this coming decade, then if by a chance I mean 20%, or by a chance I mean 1%, then me and another person may disagree quite a bit, and that disagreement could be hidden by the word, like, you know, a decent chance or something like that. Uh, I think in the Tetlock Super Forecasting book, he mentions that in the Bay of Pigs Kennedy mm -hmm. thing, there was a situation where, you know, an advisor said to Kennedy, you know, there's a a good chance that this will succeed. And Kennedy thought he meant like 60 or 80%. And he meant like 20, you know, something like that. There was like a miscommunication. And the, the difference between a one in a hundred and a 20 in a hundred is like really big, right? And totally could affect a decision. So yeah, I think it is good to communicate whether two people are agreeing or disagreeing. Yeah, that's the communication aspect. But even if I was the only person alive and I was just like, you know, in a post-apocalyptic world where I was like deciding what berries are safe to eating, I would still use this quantifying thing. And the reason for that is that because the implications of different beliefs can mean that the values of different actions are like very large. So if I think that the probability of Taiwan being invaded by China next year is... 50 50 then i probably shouldn't go on a vacation to taiwan if i thought it was one percent then maybe i would go i think you could try to reason without quantifying it with actual numbers but i think that there are just some things that i am you know a hundred times more certain about than other things so some things i think you know if you ask me what's the probability of x will happen i'm like 50 50 and others that i'm like 90 10 and others that i'm like 9.99 and i think that is like decision relevant and you know even though I, do, I rarely write down those exact numbers and then write down the exact values i put to the outcomes and like multiply it out but i think thinking roughly in that way heuristically uh yeah it does like help and represent how 
my mind is actually like thinking about these things implicitly. So if you just didn't put numbers on the probability of China invading Taiwan, you would be paralyzed, like and not be able to make a decision? Um, because it seems to me that you would like if you arrive at the 50 50 number and I say, why do you think that you would give me a cogent and well argued um, set of reasons why maybe um, the invasion of Russia into Ukraine has emboldened China. Uh, maybe we've seen some evidence that China is starting to mobilize on certain like on its uh, coastline, etc. And I claim that that's what's actually moving your decision making. It's the set of arguments that you have used to arrive at the number. Um, but even in the way that you described it, you started to conflate subjective probabilities with the objective probability of what will actually happen. Um, and that's, again, just sloppiness, because one is a degree of confidence. It's a belief state. And the other is a, a statement about what will actually happen, whether or not you believe it. And this is why I think the number game can be dangerous, because people take Toby Ord's one in 10 probability not as just a subjective confidence thing, but as like, holy shit, there's actually a one in 10 chance that we're all going to to die. You also mentioned the communication aspect. And on the communication side of things, like there are times when you want to give your degrees of certainty and uncertainty. And I think that we can roughly do this to a granularity of one in five or one in 10. So this is what doctors uh, and uh, pollsters use when they try to get people's, uh, elicit people's beliefs. Like how confident are you? Um, strongly uncertain, kind of uncertain, neutral, strongly, or kind of certain and very certain. And so I still talk about things being likely and unlikely. I'll still talk about the, it's likely I'm gonna get a job or not. But that's about the granularity that I think this concept is useful um, because saying I'm 17% likely versus 16% likely gives you no information. But um, it is useful in some circumstances to talk about likely, strongly, likely, and people's language just naturally accommodates that. So to the, uh, the Cuba example, so if one person says something's strongly likely and another person also says strongly likely, and you realize that person A means 60%, person B means 85%, Again, what's interesting here isn't the actual percentages, because this tells us nothing about what actually is going to happen. What's interesting is the reasoning process that each person has used to arrive at their conclusions. Um, and so the reasoning process is what needs to be unearthed. And if two people differ in their reasoning process, then that's really valuable and, and it's important to for them to have that, that discussion. But the numbers thing, again, just gets in the way. To go back to your first point about, so your main point was that, well, listen, we have to wait a long time in the long-termist case, but we also have to wait a long time in the give well case too, maybe uh, five years, 10 years, 100 years, and we need to make a decision now. And so in both cases, you have to basically wait and you can't just uh, wait for feedback. To which I would say, well, we're ignoring the process which has already taken place. So in the case of give well and AMF, they are continuously testing their hypotheses about the world and being falsified. And they have this continuous process which has been going on for since the conception of AMF. And so the numbers that we get from them, first, we know that they they actually relate to something in reality. So we're just counting stuff. Um, and two, we know that these numbers can be falsified and probably have been falsified many times um, to arrive at the numbers that were presented at. But this process just cannot happen in the long-termist case. So if you are a uh, having to make a decision, I think what's very relevant is the information that you currently have to make that decision, what filtration process has it gone through? How, like, how robust do you think this information is? And we know in the case of GiveWell and um, uh, in the case where you have actual data that can be analyzed, uh, there's something to be wrong about. And it's not the case that we know with certainty it's absolutely correct, but we do know that it's gone through far more stringent testing and far more stringent um, falsification process uh, than these fanciful, fanciful speculations about people a billion years from now. Um, and so that's very relevant when you're making decisions. And it's not that you just have to wait in both cases. It's that the, the process by which the information is being uh, processed and delivered uh, is very different in these two cases. And that really matters when you're making decisions because it's different, um, not levels of uncertainty, but different. Uh, the strength of the knowledge is, is uh, what's different in these two cases. Um, and that's why it's, it's relevant. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't want to suggest that we should just wait while some blank faced authorities run more and more RCTs and we become more and more certain of things because we're never going to be completely certain of anything. The world is always changing. The RCT that was run yesterday, we could always find flaws with it or the mechanism by which it worked could cease to work because of some unknown reason. Uh, so we're always in it. I agree with you. We're always in the situation where we don't know 
things. There's lots of things we don't know. We have to act on our, under uncertainty anyway. Uh, but I claim the decision relevant thing there is the arguments you're summing on behalf of like why uh, donating to the AMF right now is better than donating to give directly. And if you came to different numbers about those conclusions, then that means you gave you had different arguments, right? And those arguments were more or less compelling to you. And I'm saying um, you should act and you should tell other people about those arguments, not about your number, because it's very hard to argue a number, right? It's compressing all this information down to just like some value that I don't know how to work with. But if you keep it at the level of arguments, you can argue with me, you can argue with Aiden, you can argue with the AMF. Um, and then that's a much better way to sort of start um, adjudicating between your beliefs. And moreover, once you start putting numbers on it, right, it's very easy. I think like you did in your example there, you start slipping between uh, and like Vaden pointed this out too, right? Like um, you say, my credence is one third that the AMF is better than donating to give directly right now. It's very easy for that to slip into. It's 30% likely that the AMF is more mm -hmm. effective than give well right now. Um, and that's like, that's a big mistake to make. It's all too easy to do, I think, once you're just, you've just abstracted yourself to the world of numbers. One more clarification I think I should make, though, is that in principle, I have no problem with people using this sort of numerical reasoning in their own head to like solidify the reasoning process. If they think that's like the best way for them to think through problems and whatnot, like I, I'm not going to tell them to do something otherwise. But one, when they're engaging with like other people in the world, they're going to have to do it at the level of arguments. It's not just enough to like yell a number at someone. Um, so that's just one reason to think in terms of numbers. Um, and then, and then, oh yeah, I, I guess two is just basically repeating what, what, uh, Vaden and I have said a lot now is that it's easy to trick yourself into thinking that you are obtaining some like objective probability of the situation, which I don't think is even sensical in the first place. Like I, I think the world is deterministic or if there's any randomness, it's at some random quantum level that doesn't really affect anything. And so there is no such thing really as like the probability that China is going to invade Taiwan. That's going to happen or it's not going to happen. And it's going to be based on a very complex geopolitical situation. All of whose details are like not known to anyone in advance. And it's going to depend on like people's ideas and technological advances and uh, geopolitical struggles. And that's yeah, but it's will or won't happen. And so it does, there's no such thing as that happening with probability 50%. So that's like, I don't know what that statement means. And so once you're work, working the world of numbers, you're already you've imported yourself into this world of subjectivity, which I think is like very difficult to to escape and is not actually tracking reality. Uh, yeah, it's interesting you bring up the determinism thing that like there isn't, it's, it's not like, like there's only one future, right? Like the future is already going to happen, you know, except for modulo quantum stuff because um, mm -hmm. yeah because i was gonna say the same thing about so like when i say there's a 50 percent chance that china will invade taiwan um yeah i agree that it, they either will or they won't so what that represents is my subjective belief about it right um and i agree that people treat like subjective and objective beliefs differently but because of this determinism thing, like if they're like, you know, if we if we think about an objective thing where it's like, OK, we have a coin or actually no, so a coin, we know the causal mechanism. But if there's like volcanoes or something and we're like, mm -hmm. OK, in the history of the world on, you know, in the last hundred million years, on average, there's been one super or one volcano every 10,000 years or whatever. It's still completely determined by the laws of physics whether there'll be a volcano in the next hundred years or not right um mm -hmm. so it seems like the difference there between that case where it's completely determined and the other case of china invading taiwan which is also completely determined so both of them i need a subjective belief about and by need i mean i have a subjective belief <laughs> um uh, cause you, you, yeah, you could say just like, oh, Nick, just don't assign subjective beliefs to that. Um, but I'm going to, so, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, um, yeah, so, so in both cases, they're determined in just one, there's a pretty good, uh, simple way of like figuring out, which is like counting the past and the other, it's like much more complicated and there's many more factors and you can't just, you know, take like, okay, how many times has, have, like, if you take the history of all countries, how many times has one of them invaded the other, you know? 
Um, Which people do, by the way. Well, people no, no, do well, for this craziness. <laughs> people people well, try actually, and do this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, so I actually, no, so I think that's totally legitimate. So I think hmm. um, you, it's like you okay. would have, you would have, um, so I think you start with your prior or your like reference class of the most like uninformative as possible. So starting with like, okay, out of every country, every two pairs of countries, which how often has one invaded the other? Then, uh, yeah, then that's like your prior. But then you're like, okay, so we now update that because the chance that uh, China invades Taiwan is higher than the chance that Taiwan, uh, or that like New Zealand invades Canada or something like that, right? I feel like we should just relabel subjective probability to informed gut feeling number. Um, because I think often that's what people mean in this kind of conversation. So I want to go back to the volcano example that you gave, yeah, or a yeah, coin yeah. flip, um, because I think there's something interesting there that's worth teasing out. But let me make sure I first understood the, the critique is, um, if the world is deterministic, um, how come Ben and I are okay with assigning probabilities to things like uh, the frequency of volcanoes or coin flips? Um, isn't there the same kind of subjectivity s- uh, sneaking in there? Because we just said the world is deterministic, so how can it make sense in this context? Is that a fair summary of your? Um... Yeah. Although I think um, I think I know the difference that you guys have between the coin flip and volcano example oh, okay. because nice. in the conversation you had or a conversation you had, yeah, um, the guy asked you the probability of a coin flipping, and then you mm-hmm. know, you had a conversation about that. So yeah, so so because we have like a causal model of how the coin flip works that we can mm-hmm. simulate with physics. But if there's some, so yeah, so that's why I'd prefer you to basically ignore the coin example and, or, or, and go with the volcano one. Okay. I, I just want to interject. I'm actually not sure if this does work. Like, I'm not sure if, I, I just don't know enough, enough about volcanoes. I'm, <laughs> I don't want to like, I don't want this to be too specific to volcanoes because I, I, I'm pretty sure they actually, I think how we predict a, vo- a volcano erupting is by looking at the physics. I think we have some physical model of like what's mm-hmm. happening around the base of the volcano. And that I don't think we actually just count previous volcanoes and then we have some super reliable Beautiful. predictive model. Um, this is, okay, this is but, perfect. Oh, no, but can I just say, uh, no, so, so totally go with that. But then off, can you just in your question also answer hypothetically, if we only had the physical record and we didn't have the thing, how would that change it? Would you still be more confident sure, okay. in that than in nuclear uh, questions, etc.? Well, it's, it's the physical record. So the historical record of what happened, plus theories of physics, which can say either the frequency of volcanic eruptions can be uh, approximated with certain kinds of probability distributions, then the theory might be updated in which we find actually there's more sophisticated models. So it's always data plus modeling assumptions. Um, Mm -hmm. And then we can argue about these modeling assumptions. Um, And some of these modeling assumptions might be silly uh, and others might be relatively reasonable. So an example of like a reasonable modeling assumption is when people talk about the probability of miscarriage in the first three weeks of pregnancy is X. Well, what we're saying there is that uh, there are a huge number of complicated factors which we don't totally understand, which can cause uh, women who are in that uh, stage of their pregnancy to uh, to miscarry. And because we don't know all these details, um, we will uh, approximate it with a frequency um, and maybe add some more sophisticated modeling assumptions. But then that could turn out to be, uh, with more information, uh, incorrect or updated. Um, when it comes to predicting the future, like it's just a non-starter when we're talking about the future of human civilization, because we know that human civilization is a complex system, which in principle can't be predicted. Um, so you've, I'm sure you've heard us talk about like Popper's, uh, disproof of the ability to, to prove the, um, to predict the future. And to me, that's just conclusive. So I need to start thinking about other things. I can't get past that. And I uh, would rather (laughs) just update on that. And so, okay, we can't predict what human civilization is going to look like in 50 years, 100 years. And so let's direct our attentions to doing good in the place where we're damn certain that it's going to actually do good. And this is like one of my big annoyances with the EA movement is like, where's the EA movement on their opinion of, say, uh, Ukrainian refugees or of uh, women in Iran right now or of um, women in Afghanistan right now? Like there's all these huge opportunities of people who are suffering and who need help. But most people in EA like to talk about what AGI is going to come in the next 50 years. And so I dislike this focus of on uncertainty as if certainty is something 
worth having? Why is certainty worth having? Why do we want to be dogmatic? Um, knowledge is worth having. Uh, and the focus on certainty and belief quantification is just creating this huge uh, opportunity cost where there's places where we have actual real knowledge of real people suffering right now. And no one is working on that. Um, or at least like, like it'd just be so nice if the EA movement was much more like um, Medicine Sound Frontiers or um, the Red Cross, like dealing with people who are suffering right now rather than uh, focusing on, on people a billion years from, from now. So I kind of went off <laughs> yes. a little bit. Pain but, going um, is so box. Sorry, sorry. sorry I'll, get off my, I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> but, um, but, but this is why, like, I think listeners could fairly say, like, why are you getting so in the weeds with the probability stuff? Um, and to which my answer is, like, this stuff really matters. And it's really causing people to direct their money and attention into um, uh, places which I just think are the wrong places. So I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah. The, the modeling thing is, like, super key, right? So, yeah, it's all about the assumptions. Like, when we're making these sort of probabilistic predictions... Uh, especially like in the physical science sciences or any sort of physical model, we always have, we don't state them often, but there's always like assumptions underlying the models. So you're, you know, you're playing poker. Um, the, the deck is shuffled and then, and then you can start talking about, you know, what's the probability that I get a four of hearts on the river. Right. Um, and that's a reasonable thing to actually start putting numerical probabilities on because we can have this reasonable assumption that the the card deck was shuffled uniformly at random okay it's not true right there's no such thing as uniformly at random in nature there's that card deck is sitting there and it's in a particular order so the, the next card is going to be a four of hearts or it's not going to be a four of hearts but because we can come up with this very realistic model of how this card deck if we you know if we keep shuffling it we keep dealing these things out we're going to see like a frequency we're going to see a, a distribution over how often the four of hearts comes up and that's so that's a very reasonable thing to assign a probability to and then and then play based off of and right this is part of what professional poker players are doing all the time and some of them will even call this like bayesian updating and stuff which it is but in a very particular scenario a very constrained world where we've made very rigorous assumptions about the distribution of the card deck nothing outside of the rules of poker can happen right we're not factoring in the probability that someone bursts into the casino with a gun or something right this is all about the very artificial game of poker and so like Liv Burry comes to example right so she's like mm -hmm. huge poker star she calls herself a Bayesian uh she won a lot of money using these kind of techniques right calculating these like Bayes ratios in her head on the fly which is super impressive but now she's made the mistake of thinking that the world of poker is like the complex world at large, right? But here yeah, it's exactly. it's not the case at all because we've just we've lost the input to the system, right? To win mm -hmm. in a poker game, we know the inputs, we know the outputs, we know the distributions. We have very specified assumptions on how the card deck is behaving. To apply this to the future at large is like insane, right? Like we can't even list all the inputs, right? Like yeah. it's just it's just like the most enormous complex system you've ever you've ever heard of. And so I think we we well, you'll hear this in conversations a lot. Like even I think Sam Harris in his most recent conversation with Will McCaskill said they talked about expected value a bit. And uh, Sam said it's, you know, it's kind of foolish not to use expected value because this is how we navigate the worlds of uncertainty, like in poker or games of chance. Mm -hmm. But pokers and games of chance are not like the real world. This is like a massive conflation of when models are useful and when Absolutely. when they're not. So like always considering what assumptions are going into the model is is so key and I, I would just end by saying it in i think you you posited uh nick what would i say if all, all we had was the historical record of vol volcanoes right so we just had some frequencies we had no uh physical explanation of, of what was going on and to be honest i would be i'd be super worried about that i i wouldn't want to rely just on uh the frequency of those um because you know i'd i'd, I'd be like pretty keen on putting a lot of scientists towards the question of like, mm -hmm. how the fuck do we figure out when these volcanoes are going to erupt? Mm -hmm. Cause we've started building cities around them and stuff and we, we need to know this stuff. And so it, yeah, it just always comes down to the, to the strength of, of your assumptions. Yeah. So I, I totally agree with the poker example. And I actually think that, so that is also, I think the way I think about the give well thing is that there are these, so with poker, you have a model that you can build about you know the 52 cards the what's the probability and that gets you like very precise answers but that is only actually an accurate prediction of reality if your assumptions are right so 
if there's actually not 52 cards, if like some, you know, a card is missing from the deck or if the person you're playing with is cheating or et cetera, et cetera. And the analogous thing to give well would be there's like the randomized controlled trial data, but then that assumes that like the randomization was, you know, perfect. Mm -hmm. Or like if it was like quasi randomization, that the thing that they use to randomize wasn't a confounder or collider or something um and i yeah and that's why i that going back to my like i think there's a mix of objective and subjective is like when i'm if i was playing poker i would have my model of how it works like what my probability of getting a card is if the assumptions about the uh the model the 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 poker model are true and Mm. then i would have like uncertainty over the, over those assumptions, which I would want to express, you know, numerically of like, okay, what's the probability that my friend is cheating or something, right? And I think like it's, you know, like 1% or something. And in that situation, it doesn't matter because I'm just playing poker. But in situations where the difference in the outcomes can be really high, then I do think you need to factor those in. So yeah, so, so like the kind of more ambiguous subjective thing of like okay what's the probability that my friend is cheating or that there's a missing card in the deck is like the question of okay what's the probability that when i give amf my money they just take it and spend it on drugs and i think yeah that you like calculate those and like add that into your um decision maybe let me maybe let me ask you this like what's your uh credence that the sun is gonna rise tomorrow yeah yeah so assuming that like you know, a cloudy day doesn't, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, then yeah, it's like, you know, 99 point, a bunch of nines. Um, yeah, <laughs> okay, yeah. very high. Okay. But why not 99.1 fewer nines? Yeah. So, um, I agree that like the, the precision, right? Like the difference between if I said the number 99.19 versus 10 nines, that that is like very, um subjective and if you like ask me twice then i would like say different numbers and there's um with the super forecasting people there's experiments where yeah if you like ask them the same question on two different days and it's you know something 10 years in the future so they like you know it's not Mm -hmm. like there's been a massive reason to update they'll like say a different number but i think that like i have a imprecise cardinal strength uh belief in the sun thing And yeah, even though it's not like, yeah, like quantifying the difference between like, I can say it's definitely not like 1%, right? And then you like, you know, I could express it like a range. So I'm like, I'm pretty sure it's between 99.99 and then five more nines. And that could express like, you know, my probability distribution or like my credence interval over what an ideal reasoner would say or something like that. Um, and the reason why I do all that instead of just saying, well, Nick, just say it's going to happen or, you know, whatever, is that I think there are, so there are things that I'm like 99% sure about and stuff that I'm 99.59 certain about. And I think, in, so, so like when, if I go and uh, drive later today, I'm like 99.9% sure I won't get into a car crash, but I'm not, you know, point five more nines than that and that's like decision relevant because it's you know affects whether i wear a seatbelt or not yeah interesting maybe this maybe it's not super interesting to go down it's just uh i mean so what you're saying there is like one so you're saying the sun won't rise with probability one minus whatever you said so like 0.001 which is in effect saying that like all our theories all our all our current like physical theories of like that have the sun rising are are wrong to some extent, which I just I don't see how you could ever put a number on all our best like scientific knowledge being being wrong, right? Like to, to, to talking about the chances that there's just like there's no there's no coherent probability space you're working in. When you start talking about you know the probability that uh, the confluence of our theories that leads to the sun rising tomorrow, we got that all wrong uh, because you need to have like some distribution over the space of uh, possible ideas in this space the space of possible hypotheses. Um, But you don't know that space. You don't know all the hypotheses because we don't know what's, we don't know what the ultimate final theory is. And so this is just a very interesting example I find where like, yeah, Bayesians tend to stick to a number. Like there's 99.9% chance that the sun will rise. 
I think a more reasonable thing is just like, well, our, our given best understanding of physics has, you know, the sun rotating around the earth. And uh, based on that, unless we get hit by like an asteroid or something, the sun's going to rise. Tomorrow. Um, and so I, I just don't see what the, I don't see what the numbers there are like getting you exactly. Earth rotating around the sun. Oh, the sun. <laughs> I'm I'm stuck in the past. With that, um, the best explanation is there. Like, so is there? So there is there always the best current explanation we know given our evidence. And is there a second and third, or is there like is there an ordering over the explanations? No, not in general. There are special cases where there's orderings. If you have one explanation which completely subsumes another one, then you would say that that explanation is better because it explains more. And if that one's true, so you always kind of test. Um, from the most explanatory to the to the least, um, but the goal, and this is maybe going back to like fish swimming and water thing, you notice in in the way that we use language is different. Uh, where Ben and I tend to speak in terms of theories um, and in terms of explanations, which is uh, objective, extrinsic. Like if I re- Newton's belief about his theories don't really come into the conversation from our perspective. What he believes doesn't matter. What matters is what he wrote down and what we can argue about and think about. And similarly, we're not trying to gain confidence or excuse me we're not trying to gain certainty of particular theories we're trying to falsify them um so we try in most cases to if you have competing theories that are both of equal two competing theories which are equally explanatory then um but they contradict and one of them must be wrong and so we try to figure out which one is wrong and we can never say with certainty that the current theory we have is true but we always say that it's better than its rivals um that the other rivals haven't either don't explain as much or haven't withstood uh, testing as well um so there are special cases where you have like you can say one theory is better than another theory but in general we try to just dis- uh, disprove theories as fast as possible to be left with ones that we have the most um reason to believe is is true at a given time so tell me what's wrong with the thing i'm about to say so nice so okay so let me in coach let me in. <laughs> <laughs> so he loves this game i think that the best explanation for whether i will crash my car when i go for a drive later today like what so the best explanation is i won't crash my car right because of all the past history and also my objective so that's that's not an explanation so, that's a prediction right saying okay okay so crash so, my car is not an explanation gotcha okay so to so say is, why you won't it's, is the, it's the answer is, to a why question right an explanation is gives you the answer to a why question is the explanation that like I'm an okay driver or whatever, and okay drivers, the probability of them crashing their car or the objective frequency is one in X or whatever. Yeah, I guess. So, like, what I want to say is, like, oh, actually, okay, so here's another... Okay, so, um, and this is an example with the shrimp thing. Uh, Hmm. So, um, let's say... uh, So, I think you guys were saying at one point that, I think, Ben, that, yeah, that, like, the best explanation for what we see in terms of animals feeling pain and like reacting uh or, or you know like uh flinching away from pain and if you give them painkillers it like you know affects them and stuff is that like animals feel pain so there was a point so i i am also on the animals feel pain train there was a point where i didn't think that and i remember like arguing with my like vegan friends and i i think if i was using this language i would have said that like the best explanation is that animals, you know, don't feel pain or don't have moral value or whatever. And the second best is that they do. But, and then later I changed my mind and went vegan and stuff. I think if I could give advice to my past self, what I would say is like, okay, Nick, so let's say, again, in my language, you're 90% sure animals don't feel pain. You're 10% sure they do. So if they do feel pain, you eating them is like really bad because it's like causing way more suffering than you get enjoyment. Um, and if they don't feel pain, then like you not eating is like, you know, only slightly bad because you're just like foregoing the slight enjoyment you get. So like given the values of the decisions in either world um, and the probabilities you assign to those worlds, you should play it safe and not eat meat. So Back when I made this decision, I wasn't, you know, in the full Bayesian pilled or whatever. Um, <laughs> so I didn't do that. B-pilled. But I think in in retrospect, I should have. Um, is it so? So I, yeah, yeah. What what do you do in a situation where the best explanation, like yeah, if, if the best explanation is animals don't feel pain, but the second best says they do, and if that ends up later on 
being the best explanation after the first one's falsified, that has big decision consequences. Um, yeah, how do you decide based on that? Like, do you think my advice to myself of like go vegan now until you get more information like by playing it safe is that good or not yeah this is actually this is quite an interesting situation uh and has has i think some unique elements um the first thing i would say is that i think the better explanation is for some reasons we can get it to maybe if, if you're curious um are that specifically like mammals definitely feel pain mm-hmm. i do have more skepticism that like even like fish on down and you know it's i think it's pretty uh, pretty confusing past that and i'm totally not sure what to think about it and pretty pretty open i don't think we just have like a super good scientific theory of pain and i think one might require us to understand consciousness better and i think that's like a whole rabbit hole and if people are like super super confident about it i tend to get a little confused i so i totally take your point right that it's like okay we're in this world of uncertainty one of these actions you know, if we're if we're wrong and animals don't feel pain, but we're not eating them, it's like not really causing anyone harm. Whereas if they do feel pain and we continue to eat them, it's like a massive amount of suffering we're, we're causing. And I think that's a totally valid argument, um, especially in a world where we're like pretty uncertain about what the fuck's going on. And especially given that, especially now and especially in like pretty populated cities and like coastal regions and stuff, not eating meat is exceptionally easy. Right. It's like there's very good vegan options cooking there's like tons of uh plant-based substitutes that's super tasty it's not like being a vegan even like 10 to 15 years ago was like probably a fucking nightmare (laughs) like i wasn't one it was probably horrible i don't know if my willpower would have been able to take it but now it's like super easy for me and even just like saves me time and money um and so i think given all those considerations uh, it's pretty reasonable to say like yeah we're not um we don't have we just don't have like a great theory of pain and suffering but i think it's pretty reasonable to argue that people should uh not be eating factory farm meat uh and that's uh probably a bad thing but i totally acknowledge it's kind of a confusing situation i don't i don't think we can like rank order the explanations i don't think we're in a point where we say we can have like 56 percent confidence in the premise that they do and 48 percent confidence in the premise that we don't i don't think that sort of statement kind of makes sense um but we're totally in this world where like we don't have great explanations of any of these phenomenon and we should just take into account like what if we're wrong uh, I think you should always take that into account and look at the consequences. And so I think that's the kind of situation we're in. And I think there's good reasons to believe that mammals at least feel pain. Um, mm-hmm. So I don't think it's yeah. just like, well, we have to hedge by just saying if they do feel pain, we still eat them. Like, we don't have to do any hedging. We can just think about it. And so there's evolutionary reasons why animals would feel pain, because that's how we keep ourselves safe. Dogs, when they, they have an injury, they tend to lick it and uh, act in such a way that it, uh, they act as if they felt pain. So it seems weird to add this theory where they, they don't feel pain, but they act like they do. Um, they also respond to uh, morphine and painkillers. And we see similar behaviors in, in other mammals like chimpanzees. And, and so... I, I don't think we have to do this hedging thing. I think that it makes a lot of sense to hypothesize that animals feel pain. Uh, don't want to say animals because mm-hmm. I don't yeah. think we have nearly the same reasons to believe that like shrimp feel pain or fish. Like who the hell knows what fish feel? Um, and any attempt to, to and I wish there was progress on that. And then I would change my mind once there's more progress. But right now we just don't have that. So I think even in this case, like yeah, it makes sense to ask the question: What if we're wrong? And do we want to act in a way that kind of covers our bases in both cases? So that makes makes sense. But I think there's good reasons to believe that um, at least mammals feel pain. So, uh, yeah, so that's perfect. So, yeah, okay. So we're all on board with thinking mammals feel pain, and maybe with fish and definitely shrimp, where like more uncertain. And you guys talk about that conference you went to, where you, the you, the first speaker, who's an expert on shrimp sentience, was asked like hey, you know, do you think shrimp feel pain? And he was like, I don't know. And no one in the field knows. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, that was, totally which was such a um, hilarious it's moment. Like, yeah. I've been studying this for 20 years and I have no fucking idea. But, but, exa- <laughs> but, but, my po- but the thing is that like, so, so the way I think about this is, okay, so this expert says we're uncertain and the expert community is divided. So I guess I'll assign 50%. Given that, if there's a 50%, in, if there's a 50% chance I'm in the world where shrimp do feel pain, and then me eating them causes suffering blah blah blah. uh yeah 50 percent. then uh, yeah i should hedge and say okay i uh you know won't eat shrimp or whatever um or i will donate to this charity that tries to uh change the way shrimp are killed in a more humane way or whatever whereas there'd be some probability like if he was like 
yeah, you know, I'm quite certain, but not completely certain or where, where I would, the numbers would like flip. Um, so yeah, like, I feel like I got, I definitely got the sense that you guys, and that was what the rest of the conference was about. Like you mentioned that like this person said he's very uncertain, but then the next few experts they had were just like, you know, Hey, well, you know, even if there's a chance, blah, blah, blah. So yeah. yeah. So what's wrong with the, the, the hedging in the shrimp case? Oh, can I, tri- I okay. I'm going to do the rude thing of asking a question with a question, but it of is course, relevant. Yeah. Um, so there's an article I read and I can't remember it where they made the exact same arguments about killing bots in like call of duty. Um, so the argument there was like, we don't actually know about sentience and computer games and stuff. And just think about the sheer number of bots in call of duty that are dying. And if they like feel anything, um, if, with like a small probability, then we're causing a massive amount of harm. And so my return question to you is, do you think that is reasonable? Um, and would you be worried about killing bots in call of duty? If yes, I'd love to hear why. And if no, then that gets to my answer to your question, why I think that the shrimp thing is unreasonable. Yeah, so I would say that I think the probability that the bots, like I'm not 50-50 about that. Um, there's definitely would be some machine learning systems that you could describe to me and that like we'll have in the future where like it's approaching 50-50 about whether, you know, like GPT-7 or whatever, like, yeah, you know, there'll be some level where I'm like, oh, maybe that's conscious. The bots, I'm like, yeah, like much, much smaller. So for me, that's like the same as like, you know, uh, maybe plants are conscious or, you know, uh, bacteria or things like that. Um, and I do think there is like some chance. And like, you know, if I had, uh, you know, a, a sufficient amount of resources, I would like put some researchers towards that question and try to figure out. But uh, yeah, like given... In expectation, man. In expectation, yeah. there's so many. But there's of them. there's like no downside well, of not playing video games, right? And there's so many possible bots who are being killed. I mean, why yeah, not? So why the, not so just the, stop everyone playing video games? So there, so there is a downside, right? So, so yeah. So this is so this goes to the question of the tiny probabilities, yeah, uh, but a stuff, big thing. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. We can get into that, but that's a separate issue to whether you're fifty mm-hmm. fifty, right? Well, I think the mistaken reasoning is the same. Like we just. So in the bots, let's get rid of the bots case because that's kind of just me being a bit tongue in cheek. But no, no, it's like, yeah, yeah. Uh, but we know, like we we have no idea what these shrimp feel. Um, and the problem I have with the reasoning that you spelled out is that it can be applied to every ridiculous thing under the sun. And so this is why I'm annoyed when um, William McCaskill talks about Pascal's mugging as if it's just some hypothetical like thought experiment that doesn't affect real decision making. No, it affects real decision making in, in exactly the way with the shrimp suffering. It's kind of this like weird probabilistic blackmail thing where it's like, you don't know, but you could be doing a lot of harm. And it's like, no, what we need to do is figure it out. If you care that much about shrimp, then start trying to figure out, start trying to propose experiments. Do we know how shrimp respond to uh, Novocaine? I, I don't know, but there's probably experiments that could be run to start trying to figure this out. Um, but if we don't know something, rather than trying to act as if we do know in this weird probabilistic way, we should just be clear that we don't know and then uh, try to figure it out. But I'm not acting as if I know. I'm just taking my perceived subjective uncertainty and then acting based on that, given what the values of the outcomes are in each case. And I think like if we could list all the animals that exist in order of, you know, likely to be sentient, you know, humans, then, you know, chimpanzees, blah, blah, and we could go down. And I feel like I would have a like smooth, you know, with with each one, it'd be like a little less likely, a little less likely to the point where I'd be like, okay, the value of me squishing an ant, you know, is it like it, it flips from, you know, that based on my like very uh, pulled out of thin air numbers. But I feel like with your guys approach, it would like be some kind of discontinuous jump where you'd be like, okay, chickens, I'm like, the best explanation is that they suffer, but then, you know, this type of animal now we're in uncertainty and like, we can't make a decision because there's still the decision of like, like there's that stuff about we should like study it and research it, which I totally agree, but I still need to like decide what I eat tonight. Right. Mm -hmm. And if I've commissioned a million dollar study but it will come in next month. I have to decide what I'm going to do in between. So there's like intermediate yeah, decisions. But right? I think you can get there by just saying, 
you know, I don't really know what shrimp feel, but I'm going to play it safe because I don't love shrimp enough to risk it, um, which is essentially the same thing with stripped of the probabilistic sheen to it. And so if, if that's your view, I don't have a strong argument against that. That's that's fine. I um, I have different moral intuitions on on uh, shrimp and crustaceans. And actually, uh, so I'm a meat eater, so I'm not really I'm kind of a hypocrite in, in that. He regard. should be excommunicated but, from the yeah. whole Oh, yeah, I'm just gonna kick uh, Vayner's <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. and me yeah. and Ben. Yeah. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but so I guess the, the the more important point is that there are circumstances where it's totally fine and reasonable to say I don't know, but I'm gonna play it safe anyways. Uh, I don't like this argument that uh, you have a small credence and there could be so many of them. So the the decision optimal thing to do is because I don't think you need to go that that far with it. And I think if you go, do go that far, you open yourself up to the exact same arguments getting you to prevent playing Call of Duty and, and that kind of thing. So so on the reasonable side of just like hedging and playing it safe in that circumstance, sure. Uh, but I don't think you need to go the full Bayesian route to get, to get there. I don't know, Ben, how does that square with how you think about it? Yeah, I'm. I'm. Uh, maybe I've lost track of what the question is a bit. Like, are you are you saying like, what should people normatively do in this case? Yeah, I, yeah so, so if, yeah, so with the shrimp example... The, yeah, so my model is that if the experts are uncertain, then I should assign like 50-50 to it. So, and if it was a like 50-50% chance, then like, yeah, then I think based on the value I would get from eating shrimp versus the value that the shrimp would get from being eaten, then yeah, I like wouldn't, the, yeah, then I think like the thing to do is to not eat them. Um, But if there was a like, 0.1% chance that shrimp feel pain, then maybe it like flips. Mm -hmm. And I think, yeah, there's like some probability to which it flips and some that it doesn't. And I think it's the, I, it's the same with the call of duty thing. I just think that that, that number I assign is like low enough that mm -hmm. I'm, uh, yeah, but it's not with the shrimp case. With the experts, it was like, oh, no one, we don't know. If I think if you asked, uh, AI people like do current, existing call of duty bots they wouldn't say nobody knows they would say like almost everyone is almost certain that they currently don't right but then that would just be yeah. annihilated by the number the sheer number of bots right because it's like no matter how low you make your credence i can make the the number of bots arbitrarily high uh, and kind of catch you and so right. when you just said that it's like with the bots my credence is so low that it's never going to matter how many of them there are if I translate that back into my language, it's just be like, you find it so implausible as to not be worth considering. And so it's just like, there's no good arguments for it. It's kind of ridiculous um, as I think it is. Um, and then you're just operating on, on that. So I feel like in this instance, we're basically saying the same thing, but there's just this unnecessary probabilistic lens that's put on top of it. And from my perspective, you guys are taking your internal probabilistic representation uh, nice. and rounding that off to more like <laughs> verbal like yeah yeah um yeah that's, that's interesting that's i mean what so it maybe yeah one thing to get at the difference here is maybe the difference between like an objective theory and just your sense of like what a 50 50 probability is um and so i think vaden alluded to this earlier but like a theory is something that is sort of independent of the person who's saying it so it's like an idea it can be put out there it can be written down it can be typed on a blog and then we can all look at it together and be like these are the arguments it's proposing here's why it's saying shrimp suffer here's why it's saying bots aren't uh, conscious and then it doesn't matter what the software engineer's credence is in this thing we're just going to look at this and evaluate it as an argument but this is not what's happening in your shrimp scenario right there's it seems like the, all, all the reasoning you're giving me I could run the same reasoning, but now I have a 50% credence that shrimp love being eaten. They fucking love it. So now I'm going to eat mm -hmm. so many shrimp, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, and then what's the, what's there to stop me? This is just totally, we've both just come up with numbers about some scenario. You can't tell me, right? If, if numbers are where it's, where this is stopping and starting for you, then there's no way for you to tell me your number is worse, right? What you need to do is be like, here's an argument about why shrimp plausibly suffer. And my claim is like, we don't have any of those gut arguments right now. So there's nothing really for us to do. So it's equal. I could just be like shrimp, you know, I'm, gonna eat, I'm just going to spend the rest of my life eating shrimp because they fucking love it. Um, Dude, I'm just thinking about sadomasochistic shrimp. <laughs> just like boil me longer, daddy. Me. <laughs> boil me <laughs> longer. <laughs> boil me, daddy. Boil me, daddy. Um, um, so, yeah. So a few times you guys have mentioned this thing of like contrasting arguments to numbers mm -hmm. uh, or like the... Uh, um, so I guess like 
so so i because i'm very much like pro arguments and evidence and stuff i just like think that those like shift my credences so like and i agree that when i'm communicate if i'm like saying to you hey i think it's 50 50 that shrimp suffer you know i should like communicate those arguments that like led me to that like the pieces of evidence so that you can like analyze them separately but Mm -hmm. i think like yeah like having that like summary statistic at the end is still fine and and like so so like like with the shrimp example so let's say i'm 50 50 but now you've introduced a thing of like wait a minute nick what yeah what if shrimp enjoy being eaten now i'm like oh okay so with if that argument and i can't think of an argument against it yet then now it's like 50 percent chance that they in you know if and i can't think of a reason why to favor one over the other now i'm like okay 50 percent chance they do enjoy being in 50 percent chance they don't but then i think oh but wait a minute evolutionarily it would not really make sense for like shrimp to like enjoy being eaten right like how would genes that make them like enjoy being eaten like propagate how would that work so now i'm like back to like now now that additional argument has like shifted me back to like 95 percent sure that if they do experience but the argument came first yeah 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 so the argument came first but then it like shifted uh my belief like in my kind of made up quantitative realm <laughs> that, that said it all you're made up quantitative no realm. Well, yeah exactly so, so I'm, it's your made like, up we can't, we can't realm. prevent you yeah. from thinking about beliefs as this like yeah, sliding yeah, scale yeah. but just like one of the big underlying differences between say the bayesian view of epistemology and the paparian critical rationalist view is yeah. um one paparians don't really care about beliefs too much um and we don't think about ideas as being on this like sliding scale of true and true and falser and falser they're either true or they're false and certainty like is is a psychological belief state which is important when you're making some decisions but it's really not as emphasized in the preparing way of viewing things and it's kind of coming through in this conversation like we just talk about the arguments talk about the reasons talk about the ideas talk about the explanations um but we don't think of it as like what vein do you believe like who cares what i believe and so So that's this underlying tension i guess between these two sides of the conversation so i feel but i feel like because i agree with that right like i think things are either true or false there's only one world like objective truth is a thing but then yeah so then there's like my like my belief is like i'm trying to get that to be closer to the truth so yeah i don't care about like certainty for its own sake because i could then just assign you know like i could just pick one random thing and assign 100 percent to it so like i could make myself certain but i want to like i don't want to do that what i want is the like distance between my beliefs and the real world to like be smaller so then when presented with like an argument about whatever why do you not think uh is this true or not but instead think does this shift my belief or not the focus is always on like the new argument shifting your beliefs about stuff but thinking in terms of whether a theory is true or false is better than thinking about um, your degree of belief in a given theory yeah so the reason i don't think of it in true or false. So yes, I think of the I think of the actual theory as being true or false, but my belief being between zero and one. Yeah, continues. Um, and yeah, so I think the reason for that is some arguments or evidence would shift me, you know, epsilon close to one or epsilon close to zero. But for many, almost all real world problems, the amount of the the pieces of evidence aren't conclusive one way or the other so you know like uh yeah like i'm pretty sure that new zealand won't invade canada but like i'm not a hundred percent sure and if you showed me if there was a news article that came out that was like new zealand and canada relations have never been more tense or whatever (laughs) then like i i the world where that happens, it has to be like slightly more likely that, and by that I mean an ideal reason it needs to put slightly more credence on the statement that New Zealand will invade Canada. Um, I guess the Queen really was holding things together, hey? Yeah, no, no, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Um, Commonwealth falls apart. <laughs> yeah, fuck awesome. yeah. <laughs> Okay, one, actually, so one just question I had about the popper style critical rationalism 
which this is this isn't is meant as like a gotcha it's just i think i just don't understand with the like falsifying stuff um is it seems like again so i'll just say what my bayesian brain how that thinks and then you tell me what's wrong with that and how the critical rationalist thinks um so yeah so if if we have like a coin or a you know binary process and it's either always heads always tails or 50 50 for some reason we think those are the thing then um and we're observing flips of the coin then after the first one one of the three is like you know goes to zero is like you know falsified because like if if it lands heads and the theory that says that's impossible it always is going to land tails that's falsified but then out of the other two the 50 50 and the heads one um if, if we keep getting heads the 50 50 probability that like slowly goes to zero but it never like actually gets there like at any finite number um so but like okay so my my the example i want to ask you guys was if we're thinking about whether men are taller than women um then like the actual world is that there's two like normal distributions and that the average of the like the male height distribution is uh higher than the female one but if it was the if if, if like our theories are either like men are taller than women women are taller than men or they're like equal height um and i'm just like observing men and women one at a time mm. uh at, like my, my bayesian brain says that like eventually like the the, the the other two are never falsified right because i could just um i could just like always coincidentally be seeing taller men even though men on average are shorter uh in the in the popper falsification thing is there a point where the one of those theories is falsified and like where or is it yeah what what uh how should i think about that from your perspective yeah so you're in the very this is a very specific ground this is hypothesis testing in statistics is yeah, what you're describing yeah. right so you have one hypothesis that says this coin is 50 50 one that says it's always heads then you observe a bunch of heads and now you say okay what you know what's the probability that this thing was actually 50 50 given i observe these heads and now you can do all fa- sorts of fancy stuff you can come up with confidence intervals and confidence sequences but notice what's going on here one the hypotheses were like very well specified in advance and the and the model the statistical model was specified in advance so we knew the family of probability distributions we were working in this is the same as like the poker example we were talking about earlier right this is like a very specific setting we've made assumptions we're in an artificially created world and uh and then when you're applying this to like the real world like heights which is totally reasonable to do there you're making the assumption that heights are normally distributed which they approximately are so this is a super valid assumption of course it doesn't precisely hold but this is statistics nothing precisely holds in the real world right it's just all a matter of like how well the assumptions actually fit fit reality and uh so under and then and so under these scenarios if we're making these sorts of assumptions then i think we just let statistics do its job here we say we're you know we we posited these distributions we observed a bunch of these kind of observations um the probability after seeing a hundred heads uh that this is actually the heads tail distribution is you know one minus one half to the hundred i guess um or whatever uh you know so that's pretty low um and so but this is this is different than like falsifying like uh scientific theories where we where we're looking for areas where they make precisely different predictions like they're predictive theories about what we're going to see next whether the you know this the light is going to curve around the star or not Uh, and then we look to see whether that that happened so i think we're we're just in slightly different uh worlds here i'm not i'm not sure if yeah i mean i for me this is just where statistics comes into play and then we can always falsify the statistical model right so we can always come yeah yeah, so we can always come along and say oh it's an unreasonable assumption to assume that heights are normally distributed right so maybe we're not in uh what is what does taleb call these two worlds like he has like a normal like uh, a he has extremist stand yeah so he's like worlds where normal distributions describe uh phenomenon then we're like somewhere not like in financial uh in financial sectors there you're an extremist stand right so it's like some crazy power 
uh, curve. Just, oh, I was just going to add a plug for, I think, uh, Andrew Gelman, a Bayesian statistician who uh, I love, uh, wrote a great paper um, reconciling uh, Bayesian statistics with Popperian falsification. Um, and so oh, totally okay, that sounds yeah. great. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'll, I'll dig it up and send it um, after this chat and put it in the show notes. Um, yeah. But yeah, so you can totally falsify statistical theories. It just, you have to uh, do it with um, yeah. statistics. Uh, so in this context, you use statistical tools to falsify your modeling assumptions. Um, what have you. Uh, so it's, there's, there's, there's no tension between the two. Okay. So in that case, can you just walk me through an example of a theory being falsified? Like, um, in yeah, a statistical like, sense or in, no, no, sorry. just like, like a theory of physics or something just like, yeah. The, well, the famous example is, uh, Arthur Eddington, right? So he was the one who experimentally tested, um, Einstein's theory where Einstein predicted that there would be light visible on the side of a solar eclipse. And so seeing the light where uh, Einstein predicted was just a full-throated falsification of Newton's theory. So Newton um, didn't predict that light would bend, that gravitational uh, forces would bend light. Einstein did. We know that Newton is wrong. What we don't do, what we do not do is say that this uh, reduces our credence in Newton's theory. Um, Newton's theory is just wrong. Um, and it was a good attempt and it's useful in some domains, but it's just wrong. Um, and so now Einstein's theory isn't said to be true. We can't say that it's absolutely true, but it's um, resisted falsification. Um, and it's the best theory of, of uh, large scale planetary movements we have. And so that's the best theory so far. So the best explanation in the general relativity case is um, general relativity uh, and Newtonian physics has just been falsified. Uh, and so that's an example. Okay. So I think in a lot of physics, there's like measurement error Right. So I don't know enough about the light example, but I'm like pretty sure in particle physics or whatever that mm -hmm. like, yeah, that, that like you can detect something within a certain margin of error. Mm -hmm. And then you, you know, if you detect it like several times. So like it definitely seems like there's like not just stats, but like in physical situations where you can, yeah, like because of the, inaccuracies of the measurement tools you're using you can never get like a hundred percent absolutely certain you can yeah, say that like yeah yeah so 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 again so like um which is what which like, is why i said you we can never say that it's true and the same applies to falsification so this is the dune quine thesis um which says that oh, okay. falsifications can be wrong as well oh okay cool so 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 falsification so it's not like a binary it's not like um ah so no the big difference is truth versus certainty so um okay. Theories are either true or false, but we can never be yeah. certain of the truth or certain of the falsity. So uh, we could always be wrong. We could even be wrong about the light experiment. So it was reproduced, of course, and now. Um, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but so it's always certain enough for practical purposes to move on to the next thing. But at no point are the assumptions ever untouchable or unquestionable. Um, and so, so yeah, so the certainty of these theories doesn't even matter from a Popperian lens. Like the certainty is just not what we're interested in. Um, we're interested in the truth or falsity. Okay. So, but then that makes, but then that makes me think we're, we're, we're doing the same thing and just with different language, right? Because yeah, like when the first, that first observation, you know, if I was alive at the time, I'd be like, well, okay. So unless there was some measurement error or, you know, the guy lied, then yeah, sounds like, you know, Einstein was right. So but because there's always that small chance, I'll be like, okay, 99% sure Einstein's right. And then 20 years later, when there's been like a dozen replications, the chance that all those people are lying or all those measurements messed up while by and it like decreases. But yeah, I'm still, I'm still like, there's still a one in a trillion chance that like, you know, it's a big conspiracy and blah, blah, blah. And it seems like you guys are also saying the same thing, right? But just maybe without the like actual attaching numbers that like, there is actually a chance that Einstein is wrong and not just that, well, so he's wrong, but that like Newton is right. And that everything since, you know, in the last 200 years has been, uh, you know, elaborate thing, but it's just like, for actually, I think we know purposes. for sure Einstein's been wrong, right? Well, no, cause oh, I was going to say that like, I, yeah, that like Einstein, cause, cause like, well, cause it can't be the full picture, right? If it clashes with quantum, um, like quantum could be wrong. Of course, like Einstein could just be hundred percent. Right. But, um, it seems at this point, like neither of them are right. Which yeah. which does pose a problem for the Bayesians, right? If we're we're looking at these two theories, we have every reason to believe both of them are just false because they can't reconcile with each other. And so there's probably some unifying theory out there. We don't know it yet, but that means your credence in both general relativity and quantum mechanics should be very, very low, right? Because yeah. we know they're both false. Yeah, totally. Um 
but but wait but that's an issue right because now well, you have you're supposed to have really really low credence in both of these things what do you have high credence in yeah yeah so i would say um yeah so there is this issue of like yeah i agree it's definitely like inelegant or like doesn't fit my bayesian mind when there's like the true hypothesis is like outside like the true theory is like outside of your like theory space and there's like mm. so yeah so in this example it's like yeah so like there's some third theory that looks a lot like einstein general relativity on one scale and looks a lot like quantum field theory on another scale and you know there's some way of reconciling those two but yeah each theory individually is like not true yeah so yeah so my like belief is that yeah there's like some theory that reconciles them and like in practice i'll you know when i'm trying to calculate something i'll use one of those two theories but yeah but i agree that like both of them have like you know zero probability well actually i guess like we could be wrong about whether you can reconcile them so maybe like mm -hmm. you know yeah um <laughs> something small what i should say is like in practice i do agree that often there's no disagreement about like the practical action you should take next between bayesians and whoever else um i would say in fact the majority of the time that's the case but where it is the case and where the rubber meets the road is kind of precisely like what Vane and i've been making noise about which is like the long-termism stuff right where yeah. um you put start putting probabilities on that the agi is going to kill everyone in the next 10 years and this is a big problem and becoming a bigger problem judging by my twitter feed which has people <laughs> consistently saying they're afraid uh that they're going to be dead within the yeah. next 10 or 20 years and are not having kids and are not taking vacations and are no, yeah. no longer saving for retirement and all this stuff I and mean, this yeah. is i mean i'm saying this grinning but it's uh it's pretty it's remarkable no yeah so i definitely do agree that like um, so yeah, I'm like obviously much more sympathetic to the AI long term and stuff than you, but I definitely agree that like there are some ideas that like are harder to think about and believe in and still be like mentally healthy, right? Like Bayesianism? <laughs> <laughs> no, well, they're not Bayesianism, but I would say that like um, yeah, I, but I don't think this is connected to sorry is is intrinsic to the AI stuff. So in um this book called The Doomsday Machine where uh ellsberg the guy who um yeah he wrote and uh, who worked on like nuclear stuff in like the 50s and 60s um kind of like he was like in the room during the cuban missile crisis and stuff and yeah he talks about how him and his friend like didn't save for their retirement or like didn't bother putting money towards their ira or whatever because yeah they thought that like they were all gonna die um yeah, yeah so with the anti with the unpredictability of the few okay so here is my model is that okay no so there's like the future is unpredictable because in order to know what will happen we need to know what ideas people will have and what mm -hmm. knowledge will be generated and what technology will be invented and we can't know that because if we like i think there's some kind of um almost like halting problem argument that like if there was a way of gener of like knowing what knowledge would be created then we could like already know that knowledge or like mm -hmm. we could like yeah is, is that right because yeah because that i think i disagree with yeah so let's um yeah yeah so that's exactly right so premise one is that the future is influenced by our scientific theories and our knowledge and our ideas uh yeah. and then premise two is that uh we can't know those ideas in advance uh because to know them in advance would be to know them now and so they wouldn't be future knowledge. We just know all of all of the future ideas. We'd have them now. Um, and so to make this a little less abstract sounding, there's you can consider. I, re I just read this quote in a book. Someone linked it, um, and I forget I forget whose book this was in. Baden might know, but this author was describing uh, this precise proof, but concretely in terms of a wheel. So they said, imagine I, I forget when the wheel was invented, like ten thousand BC maybe or something. So go back to 15,000 BC and say you're hanging out with your friend and you say, oh, I predict in 5,000 years something called the wheel is going to be invented. And this is going to be a round object, right? It's going to have some spindles or whatever the fuck a wheel has, right? It's going to be this circular shape and its diameter is going to be so-and-so. And it's going to you know, be able to roll on the ground like this. without. It's not going to have sharp edges, right? Uh, what you've done, what you've just done is invented the wheel, right? So you've just described what was going to be invented in 5,000 years, thereby inventing it. So, And this is a perfect example of not being able to predict 
future knowledge. So this is when I when when he's talking about not being able to predict those ideas which are going to influence the future. It's this kind of thing he's talking about because to be able to predict them, to be able to talk about them, would be to invent it right now, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and we've just posited these ideas are going to be uh, happening in the future. And so you could take the wheel and you could talk. You could talk about the internet. You know, talk about any one of the technologies that have kind of revolutionized the world and our day to day lives. And to have described it perfectly beforehand would have been to invent it then. Um, Faden, do you remember whose quote that was? Or like, what yeah, book? Alistair McIntyre. Alistair um, McIntyre and After Virtue. So my my problem with that is that I can look at uh, records of like solar panel efficiency and say like, okay, every you know, for every year in the last 20 years, the, you know, efficiency of solar panels has like gone down by some percentage. So that will, you know, could eventually stop, right? Like I'm not like 100% certain that trend will continue forever. Um, But like, I, you know, I predict that five years from now, solar panels will be more technologically efficient. Um, But I have no idea how, Right. Like, like if you ask me, like, well, how would that be? I like, yeah, I like I can't describe the wheel. So like back to the in the wheel metaphor, it would be like if the person said, I don't know how, but I think a technology will be invented that will like allow us to move faster than we do now or to move objects faster. Right. Um, and back in the like, because the wheel was like the first thing to do that, that person might not have anything to base that on. But like after the wheel was invented and then improved and what, you know, like, um, so yeah, so, so like, it seems like I, I can predict that a future technology will be developed, right? Like, again, not with well, you're certainty. predicting that there will be technology in the future. Yeah, um, exactly. That's different yeah. than spelling out the, yeah. um, the technology in advance. So, and the consequences and the, thereof and the, and the like consequences. Yeah. So that's like, so Popper's proof is about predicting the future course of human history. Um, and so he's mainly attacking these large scale civilization level predictions, like predicting um, that the world's going to end in 2012, like the Mayans did, or predicting there'll be a singularity in uh, 10 years or 20 years, like Kurzweil does. Um, but that doesn't preclude all predictions about everything. So if you see a trend, uh, depending on the trend and depending on how far you carry it out, it's, it can be reasonable to predict the continuation of a trend, but it becomes quickly unreasonable when you go further out into the future. Um, and depending on the trend you're talking about, uh, it's reasonable or less reasonable to different degrees. But um, but it's just clear that there's some nuance around what Popper is uh, disproving, and he's mainly attacking these large-scale civilization level predictions, such as AGI coming around and turning us all into paper clips. Um, yeah, totally. the stuff, or, or literally anything that is in the precipice talking about, for example, um, the long reflection period we're talking about just these epochs of history, um, like the Future of Humanity Institute. What Popper disproved is the ability to produ- predict the future of humanity. So everyone working at the Institute is well um, advised to take that on. Good thing they're not called predicting the future of yeah. humanity. Yeah. <laughs> um, so some people think AI is going to happen in like 10 years now, right? Um, or, or 20, like in some like short amount of time. I, I definitely get the sense you guys are skeptical of that. But there's other technologies that, I predict will happen in 10 or 20 years or uh, so like, for example, um, you know, clean meat is something that a lot of people in the EA animal space is or like lab grown meat is uh, like excited about. Um, again, that like, you know, it kind of exists now, but like the price per kilogram of meat is more. So like we hope that there'll be a thing, a, a curve um, mm-hmm. uh, synthetic biology, like the ability to for some, uh, you know, loan, uh, non-state actor to be able to uh, make a bio-engineered pandemic that can kill a ton of people. Again, that's like a technology that's somewhere on the horizon. Maybe not quite now, but like it seems reasonable in the next 10 or 20 years. So is the difference between AI happening in 20 years and lab-grown meat happening in 20 years, that doesn't, that's not caused by this popper human future society thing right it's like like the reason why you find one more credible than the other is because of particular arguments about those technologies well one's also already happened yeah which is a big difference like lab grown meat exists it's just very pricey right yeah and so there we have arguments about why if we put it on the market it'll first be bought by richer people that'll drive down the price 
put more research into it, it'll get cheaper, et cetera. Like you have arguments to that effect. Um, but the but it exists. Lab grown meat is not mm-hmm. something we're just imagining, right? It, it can't, exists. Can't you get it at Tim Hortons too? Like, don't they have those? Uh... There's a difference between like plant based meats and lab grown meat. Oh, okay. I was confusing. So, like the lab grown would be actually like like real meat, yeah. but just not. Uh, I see. Yeah, yeah, I see. From an animal. But in like the 90s, I feel like I could have still predicted lab grown meat, right? Like in the 1600s, <laughs> I couldn't have, right? Oh, sorry. Are you, are you guys just skeptical of that 90s? Well, thing? I, well I don't or? know. It's just, it's I don't, just yeah, I don't, a backcasting. Like, I, it's easy to say, like, I could have predicted the internet in the 70s because you already know about it. <laughs> um, well, but, like, with the, yeah, so, so with the internet example, I, yeah, may not have been able to predict, like, oh, yeah, there'll be a thing called the internet or whatever. But I would be like, okay, it seems like the time it takes to communicate between different points on the planet is, like, going down, you know, like, at one point. You had a person walking with a letter, then you had a horse with a letter, and then you had a uh, radio or whatever, throwing some steps in between there. Yeah, so I can be like, okay, there's this trend. And also, like, from what I know about, like, the world and economics, if there was a faster way of communicating over long distances, that probably would be economically valuable. So if we do have a, if there is a way of doing that, then, like, it would be invested in by uh, corporations and governments and stuff. So yeah, like I, I couldn't have predicted like the internet, but I could have predicted that like, you know, over time there'll be like faster, more high bandwidth communication in long distances. Aren't there all these like famous examples of like television reporters and news anchors and stuff like hearing about this fancy thing called the internet and thinking who the hell would use this? Um, you can dredge up all these examples and like people t- always talk about Philip Tetlock from the perspective of super forecasters, but the first half of his career, he just documented the many, many, many experts making all sorts of wild predictions and getting them all sorts of different kinds of wrong, right? And so it's it's always easy to say after the event happened that I could have seen that coming. But when you look at the track record of expert predictions um, throughout the last 50 years, as Tetlock has analyzed, uh, we just see that experts continuously get it wrong. And so that kind of like these are the so-called experts of, of all the people who should be capturing trends and knowing what's coming and making predictions about the future. Mm-hmm. You'd expect the experts to, um, but people just always get it wrong. And that's because you just don't know what's going to catch on until it catches on. Uh, we don't know which memes are going to spread and what, what society is going to look like. You just have speculations um, based on trends, based on gut feelings, based on what have you. Uh, and you just look at the history of people's speculations and they're continuously, embarrassingly, tragically wrong all the time. Um, also, Vaslav's meal has done a lot of good work uh, dredging up like predictions on energy. Um, and you think in, in energy, the case of energy, like looking at trends about civilization, excuse me, population growth, you could easily try to make forecasts about um, like existing oil deposits and existing coal deposits, and people just get this wrong all the time. Um, so I think of that when people say, well, I could have predicted this. It's like, could you? Are you sure? It's much safer, I think, to just um, not get into the prediction business in the first place. Also, it's one thing to predict like automation speeding up or communication technologies becoming more efficient or transportation becoming faster. And another thing to predict, you know, like the Arab Spring because of social mm-hmm. media, right? Like <laughs> these are very specific consequences of exactly how the internet has been instantiated, the protocols governing it, et cetera. And like, this was totally unforeseen by everyone. And like, if someone tells you they they foresaw the Arab Spring in 1970, then they're, in, they're insane. <laughs> like, <laughs> I think there was a quote from Super Forecasters that you guys mentioned where it's like, if you thought it was, there was one US president that like, yeah. Well, yeah. And it's like, yeah, if, if you think you could have predicted this 12 years earlier, you may have the largest uh, case of uh, hindsight, hindsight bias that yeah, psychologists exactly. have yeah, ever exactly. observed. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, awesome. So I, I do want to, yeah, okay. So with the super forecasting thing, so, so one thing I want to mention is, yeah, so the experts can be uh, super wrong. And I think that's, um, you know, really important. Um, interestingly, with the in that, so in the original expert political judgment, um, mm-hmm. he had both. Yeah, so he asked experts. They were like, you know, as good as chance. Um, and hilariously, the experts that were more likely to get like media interviews were like worse um, mm-hmm. because they were like selected for like big, bold predictions of like, yeah, this is going to happen. However, uh, they had statistical models that they compared the experts to that were like, the most uninformative thing. So it would be like, you know, okay, like kind of the stuff we were talking about earlier with like nuclear war or countries invading other countries is like, okay, if the question is like, will 
this country have a revolution? Well, how often in the last 50 years have countries had revolutions? One in X. How often has it been in like, you know, maybe they'll like narrow the reference class to like this continent or whatever, or like, you know, communist regimes or something. But yeah, but those like not only did better than experts, they like, you know, did predict better than chance. So I think that is in tension with some of the stuff you guys have said. So yeah, maybe I'll get your reaction to that and then talk more about other super forecasting things. You know, I, I don't know if it's necessarily in tension with what we've said. So one of the points that Ben made on that podcast, which um, I think is an important one, is you're talking about Briar scores of like 0. 0.2, um, where random chance is 0. 0.5. And a Briar score of 0. 0.2 is approximately like 60% accurate. So we're not predicting with very much certainty here. We're predicting maybe 10% better than than random chance. That's that's the first point. The second point is that um, there's a good analysis of um, super forecasters on the Effective Altruist Forum. And one of the main things is that predictions aren't accurate at all any point beyond a year. This is just empirically by looking at like the meticulous forecasts first predictions. So people want to use super forecasting to justify making predictions about when AGI is going to come around over the next 100 years, when really we're talking about like slightly better than chance for things happening less than a year. And this doesn't even... Uh, include the whole problem of bla black swans, that you're making predictions about stuff that you know about, but the real things in the future are exactly what Ben was just saying, things that we don't have the language to even conceptualize yet. So lastly, um, when Tetlock dives into how these super forecasters make predictions, uh, they don't use Bayes' theorem. They're basically just guessing and checking. And so they're being very Popperian, and it doesn't surprise me that you can have some people who do marginally better than guessing the very near-term future, um, and then everything just peters out into blackness after that. Uh, so I think all these caveats need to be um, emphasized right at the beginning because people just think about super forecasting as just some way to like predict the future, and you can gather a bunch of super forecasters and aggregate all their belief scores, and then you get, uh, holy shit, 13% chance of AGI by 2035. It's like, oh my God. It's like, come on, you got to incorporate all this other stuff and you can just know instantly which kinds of predictions are just to be ignored, anything beyond a year, for example. Um, so that's my opening burst about super forecasters. I don't know, Ben, did you have anything to add? To no, that? that was perfect. That was great. Awesome. So one thing is with the, it's actually worse than that, that point two thing. It's actually worse. Mm. So um, a guessing randomly uh, with the Briar score, you actually is 0 0.25 is what you would mm. guess randomly. Oh, because it's squared, right? So random yeah, is just yeah. 0 0.25. Yeah, right, mm. right. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, that's annoying because, yeah, when you try to, like, write this down, it means that, like, the, the negatives can be, like, way worse. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, if it was symmetric, it would be easy to think about. Yeah. But, yeah, so it's 0.2 is, like, even worse than, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, so but I do remember translating, like when we did the book, yeah, I can't remember the exact scale, but I do remember translating the values into like percent accuracy. And it, it was like for the best super forecasters, it was around like 60 to 63%, I think is what they were getting on average. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Although I'm not sure what, because they give like probabilistic forecasts, right? So do you know, was that like, if you round everything up that like everything they say, they give 51% or higher that happens but no the, so that's what that's how you compute the briar score right is it's like the l2 did well it's like the you so you take like it's one or zero if it did or didn't happen then if i said if it did happen and i predicted 80 percent, then you get 0. 0.2 squared and then you sum up all their predictions yeah so uh metaculus which is a uh forecasting platform it's like quite similar to tetlocks but they like um yeah, you know, cooler and whatever. Um, but yeah, well, I thought it was the set. I didn't realize it was different. I always thought Tetlock was metaculous. Interesting. Okay. No, no. There's like, some, so there's some heat the, in the forecasting communities. Yeah. So the metaculous, it's definitely very much inspired by super forecasting and Tetlock's work, but it's, yeah, it's like run by separate people. Oh, um, uh, so, yeah. So they had a question uh, in 2016, which was, will there be a naturally spawned pandemic leading to at least 100 million reported infections or at least 10 million deaths in a 12 month period by the end of 2025? And between 2016 and 2020, uh, the probability that the, you know, community, the average or whatever, was between 38% and 43%. It like went up and down a bit. Um, so yeah, so like, because COVID fits that definition, it seems like that, yeah, that they like, 
Like they didn't say, oh, it's 90% likely COVID would happen. But like, if you had known, like if I knew that there was a 40% chance that there'd be another thing in the next 10 years as bad as COVID, that would like influence my decision making and like where I should donate to if I was a government on what I should do. So yeah, so that seems like really valuable. And yeah, something that I think you, it seems like your theories predict that wouldn't be able to happen. No. So Bill Gates was on the campaign trail for a while trying to get the world prepared for a pandemic in 2015, 2014, um, because he was very influenced by Vaslav Smil, who also made the exact same prediction that by, I think, I think he put a, like a five-year margin of error, but he said with like 95% certainty, there will be a pandemic before 2022. Um, people have to fact check me on that. I'm getting the details kind of wrong. But, uh, but Vaslav Smil, he's not a future predictor. He's very critical of Bostrom um, as, and it's been a big influence on me, but how was he able to do that? Well, Pandemics are periodic, right? So pandemics happen almost every 50 years. Um, and you can just look through the history of pandemics. There's been big ones every 50 years uh, because we know how um, bacteria or viruses spread. And so it doesn't surprise me that on that particular subject, Meticulous did well because we had other strong reasons for why there's going to be a pandemic. It's not just blindly trusting super forecasters. It's, uh, there's actually a good reason here to be worried about this. And that's why Bill Gates was doing that well before Metaculous came around. So that's how I would interpret that. But also, if you're a prediction platform and you just make predictions all day, every day, um, after a couple of years, you're going to get some of them right. N them getting some of them right doesn't surprise me uh, because, of course, some things are going to happen and the, the pandemic is a good example of something that we knew was coming. And so Smil wrote that, I think, in like 25, uh, 20, 2005, 2006. Um, so there are ways to make predictions, but um, they can be done much more scientifically uh, than just uh, aggregating a bunch of beliefs from people. Yeah. Do you happen to know why it's every 50 years? I was kind of curious, like what's the mechanism there? It's like some rate of evolution of bacteria yeah, or something? Is there like yeah, some... I'm sure Smil talks about it. I, I don't remember, but um, like or 20... viruses, I guess, not bacteria. I think there was another small pandemic in like the 60s um, mm -hmm. and then 2020. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I've first I totally acknowledge the thing of potential like cherry picking, like in the alternate world where this number was like one percent. I like it's it's just true that I wouldn't be bringing this number up in the debate, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. so yeah, that that is like fair enough. No, 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 just to add, I'm pretty sure in our super forecast episode, I referenced a quote which I don't have offhand, but um, a different predicting platform gave like a zero point like three percent probability of there being a big pandemic. That might have been more related to Tetlock. Um, and I can find the citation for that uh, after afterwards. But uh, Metaculous so, wins. Yeah, Metaculous <laughs> wins. <laughs> yeah. But like, you'd expect there to be convergence okay, amongst yeah. all these platforms if there was a true signal rather than just getting uh, lucky. So sorry, sorry to cut you off. I just wanted to add that. Yeah. So, so if they had a prediction, which was like 10% of a not natural, but like human engineered pandemic, would you be skeptical of that because there's not this historical track record thing? So you couldn't do the like once every 50 years? Yeah, exactly. Thing? Yeah, but same with they predict people are going to be invaded. And, and again, just first filter. Is it a prediction beyond one year? Ignore it. Just ignore it. <laughs> then of the immediate 12 months or less predictions, then maybe you can get slightly better than chance in some of them. But um, But predicting beyond that is is futile as tetlock acknowledges himself yeah i'm assuming that smells thing isn't just a it's not based on periodicity though it's based on some actual mechanism whereby viruses are yeah. evolving something at every like at some rate right like i, I don't think yeah. he would just be like well it happens every 50 years therefore it's going to happen and i'd be surprised yeah, if he also said precise. it's going to be a worldwide pandemic as opposed to like there will be an evolution they're like something will evolve that has the potential to cause a pandemic it will probably like infect some people in a region and then either we'll control it or we won't i'd be surprised if he was like there, there will be a full world anyways I, I won't dig it up now but um but i can try to find some relevant uh, material after excellent yeah so on the future like more than one year yeah so i i agree that the tetlock uh okay so, so one is that the the statistical models like i guess like the experts in the tetlock thing were like experts in their like domains and were like making predictions and stuff but like the metaculous stuff, so like, so with the statistical models, like if statistical models can predict stuff more than a year in the future, like the, uh, you know, chance this regime will like collapse, then 
and like metaculous predictors know that then they can just use those models and like predict exactly what those like models say um so yeah i think the fact that the original people in the political expert political judgment couldn't predict more than a year in the future doesn't mean that uh like human forecasters in general can't predict more in a year in the future and i think like yeah i would like predict that uh so yeah like metaculous i guess because that's from 2016 has been around since 2016 um yeah oh, and actually you know falsifiable prediction we can mm-hmm. yeah but i would predict that yeah that like they are better than chance more than a year in the future it's from it was a post on the ea forum which i will share okay where he just aggregated all the data from metaculus and the score that was that within less than a year the, they were re- relatively calibrated calibrated but between one to two years and two years beyond just no calibration um and this is just aggregating all the predictions that were made on metaculus uh, over the last six years i guess um yeah interesting because like yeah, I guess because there's like a sympathetic person who was writing this too, so I'm not. No, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, totally, yeah. yeah. No, yeah, I have to read that. Um, yeah, I guess because it's, it's like, yeah, because like, so I guess it depends on like what your prior is. So, like with the like countries invading other countries, I think if you start with a prior that's like, you know, every possible pair of countries is equally likely, then you can update. You can like update from that quite strongly um by saying like okay the chance that like russia invades ukraine you know it's definitely higher again than like the new zealand canada example but now we're just cycling back to everything we talked about at the first half of the conversation is you can start spelling out your um belief your thought process and the arguments etc uh and that's that's the good stuff that's what we want but what's unique about the super forecaster case is that what's supposed to be like we don't know what these people's thinking strategy is. All we care about is their ability to predict the future. And they're super forecasters, so they can predict the future about everything across all domains. And again, when you look at the actual results of this, it agrees with Tetlock's first book, which is that people who self-identify as an expert, or now we could say a super forecaster, are very confident and very wrong most of the time. Um, and now we can maybe say that it's a bit more precise that they're wrong when they're making predictions of beyond a year out. Um, so I would just add that because it's kind of talked about as if there's this like class of superhuman geniuses who can see into the future beyond the horizon that the rest of us can see. And this is much more limited. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I agree that we are circling back. Um, so yeah, might be a good time to bring it to a close. Yeah. Okay. So this was good. I think, yeah, so I'll, I'll summarize what my takeaways or what I learned. So yeah, so I definitely think it was really good to know that thing about that falsification isn't like binary and that you can you can think you've falsified something and then be wrong about that and stuff. Um you said there was a thing you mentioned about that direct point. So uh, it's called do you the remember? Doom Quine thesis, the Doom Quine. Yeah, so yeah, so that was good. So yeah, so I definitely yeah, I think I understand more than I did from just listening to the podcasts. Yeah, I still feel like oh, I wanna I wanna come back in two weeks yeah. and talk more. Yeah. But um, yeah, but this is really good. Um, uh, yeah. So thank you so much. Um, yeah. Do you guys wanna uh, give a uh, summary or key takeaways or uh, yeah, something like that? Uh, I have nothing else to say. I think I've said it all. Um, <laughs> I, I love the EA community. I'm glad that Ben and I's conversations have kind of turned into us being um, external critics. But hopefully, the criticism is always seen through the lens of love and through the lens of concern for a friend um and that we're not too uh so critical that we're unpleasant to uh interact with yeah it was just a pleasure to be on man lots of fun yeah. good chats yeah thanks for having us yeah of course um yeah maybe maybe at some point we sh- like yeah because you guys talked about how yeah like you know is discussion is discussing decision rules and bayesian probability or like what credences mean yeah like that can get in the way of actual arguments and stuff yeah I, I yeah i'd be interested maybe we should have a conversation at some point in the future about like you know ai for example and like the actual likelihood of that and like r- yeah rather than being like you know should we assign yeah. like the actual like mm-hmm. direct arguments and stuff um Definitely. now you have to uh, assign a credence to pauperianism though just so you're aware so five percent easy <laughs> easy <laughs> Ooh, that's a sweet five percent we'll get you to six we'll <laughs> so, yeah, yeah yeah exactly Whoa. exactly okay. yeah um, one credence one credence at a time baby 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, well, yeah, no, but yeah, thank you so much. Um, uh, yeah, this is great. Everyone wish Ben luck for his um, exam or whatever he <laughs> yeah. needs to do. Um, uh, and yeah. I just need uh, luck in life in general. So just wish me luck for <laughs> in general. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, man.